Put your hands together. Welcome our Bell Chase location joining us right now live. So glad to be in church with all of you. Do me a favor real quick. Come on, both campuses. Look at your neighbor and tell them you look amazing today. You look, you look amazing. You look amazing. Come on, turn to your second choice and say, God, God is going to speak to you today. Tell the second choice. God is going to speak to you today. Tell your third choice. You really need this right now. Just kidding. So glad to be with you guys. Happy to be sharing God's word with you today. I want you to know that I am highly caffeinated and excited to tell you about Jesus today. All right, because we believe highly caffeinated people enjoy church more anyway. And so I decided I would lead the way today. And if you came to church today wanting to sleep your way through, I will throw a shoe at you. That's what I used to tell my youth church when I was a youth pastor. Like, you fall asleep on this message, flip-flops coming your way. I'm just kidding. I didn't do it ever, parents. I didn't do it. I just threatened it all the time. All right? Can you smile at me real quick? You look good. Today's message, today's message is going to be fun. We're jumping into the deep end of the pool. If you've been with us for the last few weeks, we know we kicked off a new series called Deep Thoughts. And we've been studying, and we began three weeks ago studying the nine foundational doctrines of our Christian faith. And when you hear the word doctrine, it's like, uh, what is this going to be about? A doctrine is just a, a practical teaching and understanding. And what you will discover is just about every Christian denomination, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic, we, we have all of these doctrines in common. And what makes us so different is how we practice. It's how we go through the motions. I like to say it this way. If you believe in these foundational doctrines, you've got Jesus, you've got the Bible, you've got the foundation, you've got ice cream. Come on, everybody say ice cream. Amen right there. Ice cream, right? You've got ice cream. Some people like vanilla ice cream. Some people like Neapolitan. Some people like a little kind of chocolate swirl on the top. I like, oh, Ben and Jerry's half-baked ice cream, everyone. If you're unfamiliar, it's chocolate vanilla swirl with a little bit of caramel on the inside. And just when you think, wow, that's amazing, you find uh, chocolate chip cookie dough and half-baked brownies in the middle. They call it half-baked not because you're high when you're having it, everybody. They call it half-baked because the, the cookie dough and the brownies are, are just wonderful in the middle. When I describe our practice, not just our doctrine, I always say we're kind of like Ben and Jerry's. We're a swirl of everything. We're passionate about our prayer. We're passionate about our worship. We like to move a little bit in worship, right, everybody? There's something about a practice that's important. So what we've said in this series is not only we're going to have deep thoughts, but we're going to have, we're going to have deep action. Because our deep thoughts require deep action. They require us to think about what we're doing, but then it requires us to actually do something with our faith. And so on the way in, you were given a card on today's study, and maybe some of you picked up on the fact that I said this is going to be a seven-week series, but we're going to do nine topics today. We are going to group three of them together. In week number one, we did the study of the Bible because the Bible is the most reliable source when it comes to studying God. In week number two, we did the study of God, which was probably the biggest message to try to put together in 35 or 40 minutes to try to help you kind of understand God. It was big, right? This week, we're going deeper into the rabbit hole, and we're going to look at the study of humanity, sin, and salvation. If you got your card, you'll notice that there's a belief statement. There are three of them today, and I would love every voice, Bell Chase, Paris Avenue, we're going to grab the card. It'll be on the screen if you didn't get one. I'd love for you to read what we believe together. Come on, every voice. It says, I believe that mankind is made in the image of God. That's part one. Part two of today's message, I believe that everyone is born in sin and prone to live sinful lives. That's going to be a good one, by the way. Number three, I believe God sent Jesus to save us and give us abundant life here and eternal life in heaven. We're going to look at these three teachings together because it's hard to discuss the origin of man without discussing what man did at the origin that kind of messed it all up for us. And then to talk about the reality of that and leave off salvation, it just doesn't work. So today you're getting three in one. Come on, tell somebody. We're getting three in one today. Three messages in one. And listen, I'm going to do it in like 36 minutes. Come on, everybody. I don't know about y'all. Get ready. Professor Josh is here. 
We're going to look at the study of humanity first. I believe that mankind is made in the image of God is our belief statement. We're going to look at the study of humanity, which is mostly referred to as anthropology. There are a variety of views by Christians and non-Christians concerning the origin of man. Non-Christians commonly hold to an atheistic evolution. God wasn't there. Some Christians argue for a mediating view suggesting God began the process but did it through evolution. Hence, they hold to theistic evolution. Other Christians argue for some kind of creation, either a divine act or some form of developing creation. Some believe it all happened in seven days today. I'm not here to argue whether it happened in seven or not. I'm here to simply say to you that atheistic evolution doesn't work. Here's why it will never be answer enough, and it's because atheistic evolution says something came from nothing. In all of science, there has never been a single time where something was created from nothing. There always had to be a something. So for me, atheistic evolution doesn't work. For those of you who lean more to theistic evolution, or simply the divine act of God, it says everything came from someone, namely God. I believe that as you look into the origin of man, you'll discover lots of arguments and ideas, but the most plausible one of all has to do with God. When we enter the discussion about evolution, per se, the case is made that since microevolution can be proven, then macroevolution must also be true. Microevolution, if you're unfamiliar, is the simple understanding that if you put two dogs together, one was darker, one was lighter, they're going to produce a dog that, that, that gets darker or, or gets lighter. They're going to affect one another. They're going to change in a micro sense. Also, microevolution, anybody got calluses from working out or doing some work in the yard, your skin gets harder, that's, that's your hand evolving to the task that's in front of it. As you study, you'll discover that even horses in certain places in our world where the ground is harder, their hooves are harder. Why? They evolve. Microevolution is provable in every way. But macroevolution is the idea that you and I went from monkey to man. That has never actually happened and never been proven in all of history. And Darwin himself, who purported this idea, said that if we can't find the missing leak, if we can't find a fossil record proving this, Darwin said, throw out my theory. Why isn't that part of the textbook taught from Darwin when you go to class? It's not because people who don't want to lean into God have decided it's the best thing for us to believe. There has never been a single fossil record found to substantiate Darwin's theory. You go deeper down the rabbit hole, can I encourage you to maybe look up a YouTube channel called Answers in Genesis. And if you want to spend a few minutes or a few hours looking at following a creation that is a theistic evolution or a divine moment from God, it will help you to go deeper. Even with your kids, it's fun to watch. Whenever you get into talking about carbon dating, start saying, is the earth a few 6,000, 7,000 years, or is the earth billions of years, we get into an equation where We get into so much math that my math teacher would look at me, John, and say, I need you to show me your work. Like microevolution and macroevolution, carbon dating works in smaller forms, but we multiplied it in a mindset that we can see billions, but it can never be proven. Hey, everybody, deep thoughts with Pastor Josh today. Here's where we land. Write down three things regarding anthropology. What you will discover is that if you take all the science concerning creation and the origin of man, the God of the Bible quickly becomes the most plausible answer to where we are and how we got here. So what do we believe? Number one, we believe that God started it all. 
Well, did, did it happen in a, in a bang and then it evolved? I don't know. I wasn't there. And it, most of it can't be proven differently. We just know that something didn't come from nothing because that has been proven never to work. There's always had to be something first, and we believe that something was God. Why do we believe it was God? Because as we look through history, what the Bible describes is better connected than anything else we can find throughout history. It is more plausible. Yes, it takes faith, but it takes less faith to be a Christian than it does to be an atheist. I feel like we just went to like you and know Professor Josh today, and all of you are like in deep thought with me. It's okay. Genesis 1-1, would you read it with me? Every voice, every campus says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's what I believe. I believe that, that all of the something came from someone. Minimally, I think we can agree on theistic evolution. Beyond that, have fun, everybody. Dive into the YouTube channel. Have fun, enjoy, but we're not going to divide over any other thing. We believe God and the God of the Bible started it all. Number two, second belief in regard to anthropology is that mankind is then made in the image of God. If, if God started it all, then what God said about us in the beginning is really, really important. Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Hey, everybody, we have dominion over the creeps. Amen, everybody. He goes on and says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female he created them. Hey, everyone, God started it all. And mankind is made in the image of God. You and I are made in the image of God, which is beautiful because he said that he's going to make us in our likeness. So we have the attributes of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We've got a body. We've got a soul. We've got a spirit. We look differently on the outside, but that's reflecting the beauty of God. Think about it. Look to the left, you see the image of God. Look to the right, you see the image of God. You see different colors, you see different shapes, you see different styles. Why? Because God is that kind of God. Think about it. He's a, he's a pretty amazing God. He, he's created all the beauty in the world. This is why we say around here that we value everyone regardless of their history, their heritage, or the color of their skin. Why? Because when I look at someone who's darker than me, I see the image of God. Amen, everybody. And when you see somebody maybe lighter than you, you should see the image of God. That's why we love creation, because it was made, we were made in the image of God. Psalm 139 says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body. And knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Whenever I read wonderfully complex, I think about my wife and children. Everybody like, wonderfully complex. That's them. <laughs> Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. I love David is bragging on himself. When I look at myself, I see marvelous. Come on, everybody. So it's biblical to have a healthy view of yourself. Some of y'all are laughing right now, but some of y'all have this, this, this residual thing going on in your mind that when someone said you were ugly or somebody said they didn't want you or you were, you were the red-headed stepchild on the outside, you were the, the last one when you played duck, duck, goose, you were the goose every time. Listen, hey everybody, God said you're marvelous, you're wonderful, fearfully and wonderful. Somebody ought to say amen because I'm complimenting y'all right now. He said you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Hey, everyone, God started it all. He knows where you are. He knows your story. He, know why, he knows why he put you here. Which leads me to number three. If God started it and God made you in his image, God has the plan for your life. He doesn't have a plan. He has the plan. It's not like God's up there with the, you know, you know. You ever play 52 car pickup? Anybody? Anybody when you're a kid? 
They have a place. And what do they do? Hey, we're going to gather all the little ones around. We're going to play 52 card pickup. It's so exciting. And then they throw 52 cards in there. That's not what God did with you. He is an intelligent and intentional designer. If you've never studied how a child is developed in the womb, then you're missing out because you see life beginning there. You see origin beginning there. You see the beauty and the complexity of it all coming together. How could you deny that that's the beginning when you look deeper into that moment? I love as you go into it, it starts to that look. I just call it the blob, everybody. Just that little blob begins to form into a fetus in the womb, into a child. And it's beautiful. At one point in development, you can literally see the nose. Your nose comes from the crown of your head and drops down and splits your eye. It's amazing. And then God said, not only am I going to do that, but I'm going to give you some of y'all bigger noses, some of y'all smaller noses, <laughs> some of y'all different. Like, like, think of the complexity of God. If he did that and can create order in your body to come out of a womb, did you think that he did all of that to say, hmm, what am I going to do with her now? Or is he so intelligent and intentional that he put you together for a purpose? Jeremiah 1 says, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. The word formed literally means that you're not an accident. You are put together intentionally. You're a, you're a masterpiece of God. The word sanctified means that he set you apart as special. He said, no, no, this is not going to be like, the, the, my creation is not going to be like the dress. They're not going to be like the otters. Come on, everybody. Not, you're not going to be like the dogs running about the world. No, no. You're going to be set apart as different. And then he says, I ordained you. The word ordained means called to a specific role in this world. Does that sound like an accident to anybody in this room? He formed you sanctified you and ordained you the new testament says the same thing the apostle paul says for we are his workmanship handcrafted custom designed created in christ jesus for good works that's what you were sanctified for to do good things which god prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them today i need you to understand this in studying anthropology god started it all God made you in his image, and God has the plan for your life. These are the most three most important truths you need to have today regarding. And you ought to memorize these verses, because when somebody says, you're the ugly duckling, you're going to say, no, 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 Psalm 139 says, I was fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. When someone says, that person is un unimportant, or that nation is unimportant, or these people aren't to be valued, you should stop and say, humanity is made in the image of God. Amen, everybody. Listen, we need more of this today. We need less of the angry stuff, less of the hateful stuff, and we need more of I see God in you. We need to start calling it out in the world. I think it's interesting as you look at God's creation that, that he didn't look at, at, like he didn't look at the dogs and say, made in my image. Praise God he didn't say giraffes. Wouldn't that be crazy? Every church would have to have ceilings this tall, right? If we were giraffes. I think it's interesting that of all of God's creation that he made us unique out of all of them. But it's also interesting as you dive into anthropology, you go beyond the study of man, you see everything that God created and the beauty in all of the pieces. Think about how that dogs have the ability to like interact with humans and kind of pick up on their emotion and respond to their emotion. It's, some people say cats can do it, but I would never know. <laughs> Me and cats aren't cool. Dogs are going to heaven, don't know about anything else. <laughs> when I was a kid, we, we were, you know, uh, six kids, Brady Bunch, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. Dogs were like a big deal <laughs> when we were young and my dad one time was like getting tired because we had large dogs and large dogs are like having a child they just they make messes everywhere they eat things they they just make messes right and so my dad's like we're fixing this i'm gonna get you a dog I'm, he's like he's building it up i'm gonna get you a ferocious dog he shows up with a pomeranian if you don't know a pomeranian's this big it's this big i mean it's like it's one step better than a wiener dog everybody 
The only thing that was really beautiful about this Pomeranian, though, is if you know anything about them, is they, they look like huskies. They look like wolves. They're, they're, they're genetically, like, you can study their history, that they've they, they just been bred down to be this big. They brought this dog in. He's black and brown and beautiful mane, and he was a stud. My dad's like, we're going to breed him. We're like, this is going to be bad. We named him Samson. Because of the locks of hair of Samson from the Bible. Some of y'all need to know your biblical history. And when Samson, when we take Samson for a walk, he, he was strutting down the street, everybody. He was like, he was making his moves. He knew he was this big, but he owned the streets. One time we were out, and a neighbor had a big Rottweiler. If you don't know, Rottweilers are those dogs that mess up everything. It was unchained, and that dog come barreling, barking. And I'm just a kid. We're... What are we going to do? And next thing you know, Samson is between us and the Rottweiler doing what Samson does. He's dancing, he's barking and going. Next thing you know, the Rottweiler lunges to bite Samson. Samson goes to the side, jumps, lunge. I mean, I, just, like, I wish I had a movie right now. He grabs onto the undercarriage of the Rottweiler. And that Rottweiler rolled over, <laughs> and Samson just sprinted all the way home. If God can do that with a dog, come on now, what can he do with you? I need you to see the beauty of God in yourself. I need you to breathe in the confidence that comes that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Stop being insecure because somebody said something. You need to grab a hold of Jeremiah 1. I was formed. I was sanctified and I was ordained to do this. When you do that, it changes the way you walk down the street. It really does. I can make this the entire message, but I got two more. And unfortunately, that's the most fun. There's a hard one in the middle. Y'all ready? Number two. Let's look at the study of sin. If you're into ologies, if you want to know, this is harmatology. This is the study of original sin. Original sin is what most people struggle with. Original sin may be defined as the sinful state and condition in which we are born. This is of great debate because you've probably been told most of your life that you were born good, that you were born innocent. And I understand that thought process. You may be innocent of actually doing sin on your own when you're a baby, but the Bible is very, very clear that each of us are born in sin and prone to sin. When you think that humanity is good on its own, then you're baffled by the evil that it does. When you realize that humanity isn't good on its own, then you're not baffled by the evil that you see. Let me break it down to you for you guys. Just to, uh, Do you remember the first time you had dessert before dinner, like you snuck in and you got the cookies? Come on, everybody. Everybody. I, there's been multiple times in my family when, like, the kitchen is closed, two in the morning, I was in there eating cookies, everybody. You ever had your mom or dad catch you after you've had the cookie? You think they don't know, but they see the chocolate on your face and the crumbs in your lap? Did anybody have to teach you in that moment when your mom or dad said, did you eat cookies? They already know the answer, by the way. Young people, when your parents ask what seems to be a rhetorical question, they already know the answer. Did you eat the cookie? No, ma'am. <laughs> Chocolate on your face, crumbs all over you. Did you, did you, you know, no, ma'am. Who taught you how to lie? You, no one had to teach you how to lie. Why? Because we are born with a sin nature and we are prone to sin. Left to ourselves, we will do the wrong thing. Let me show it to you in Scripture because some of you like, I like the idea, but I don't really want. I, and listen, I need to understand that all of the suffering we see in the world is a result of Adam's sin, my sin, or your sin. All of the suffering and all the pain in the world is a result of Adam's sin, my sin, or your sin. Maybe today I'm dealing with something or you're dealing with something that's not your sin and you're having to deal with someone else's. That is a reality of life. Sometimes you can do the right thing and someone else can do the wrong thing and you still have to deal with it. But let's not pretend that every one of us 
weren't born with a propensity to do the wrong thing. Number one, here's what we believe. Sin began in the Garden of Eden. That's where it began. Genesis 2 and verse 15 says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat it, eat from it you will surely die. I don't know why God picked fruit as the thing that we couldn't have. Some of y'all like still holding on to that today. Fruit got the, some young people, fruit got Adam and Eve in trouble, dad. What you discover is that Adam and Eve's sin, and then when God showed up, Eve, bl Eve blamed the snake. <laughs> Adam blamed Eve, Right? It's like the Spider-Man meme. Y'all remember this? Anybody seen the Spider-Man meme, right? Like, which one is from the multiverse? Anybody? Anybody? Y'all don't know what I'm talking about? A 14-year-old will describe it to you later. They started blaming one another. It's your fault. You did it. It's them. It wasn't me. But ultimately, when Adam and Eve sinned, Romans 5 says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to, say it with me, it spread to everyone for everyone, sin. You ever find yourself doing something and realize you're acting like your mom or dad? I mean, there's a point in your life when you just think your parents aren't cool at all. And then you see yourself doing the things that your parents do. And you realize that you're becoming that uncool person. Sin entered the world. It's in all of us. Number two, sin separated us from God. Genesis 3.22, Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out. Isaiah 59 and 2 says, Your iniquities have separated you from God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. When people ask, why do bad things happen? Why could such a good and loving God create a world that has such bad things happening? Well, can I just tell you that this is not the good and loving world that God wanted us to grow up in. This is that good and loving world that chose to separate itself from God. The further you get from God's blessing, the worse the world gets. What we are called to do in the in-between of God's story is try and reconcile ourselves and the world back to God so that we can stop all this craziness. But when you wonder why suffering is happening, you wonder why bad things are happening, it's because God created this beautiful garden of which we chose to leave. And what we have to understand is that God wants to bring us back in. He doesn't want us to be separated from Him. Number three. Sin is defined as anything outside of God's design. That's why when Adam and Eve ate a fruit, it was considered sin. Why God said, I just created this one tree for you to leave alone. Listen, when you get in a relationship with God, it has to go beyond the Ten Commandments. When, when you first get married, you're given the Ten Commandments at the altar, right? You're given, I'm going to love you. In sickness and in hell, till death do us part, you create the contract. It's kind of like we think of God. It's the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. You got all the things, right? Anybody that's been married in here for a little while knows that you got to go beyond the rule book. My wife wished that somebody had told her that the toilet paper roll had to go over the top, not under the bottom. When you get in a relationship with God, it has to go beyond the contract. It has to become a relationship where God says to you, I don't want you to move there. I want you to give this here. I want you to leave your safety there. Trust me here. It goes beyond the thou shalt not. And it gets into the heart of the relationship. 1 John 3 says that everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is Lawlessness. Sin is anything outside of what God has designed for you. 
Romans 3.23 goes on to say, For all have sinned, and how many of them? All fall short of the glory of God. Number four, we are all sinners in need of a Savior. This is a beautiful truth to understand because when you realize that we are all sinners in need of a Savior, you start, you start looking at the world differently because you stop seeing them as someone who's attacking you. You see them as someone who's separated from God and, and what you can now be able to see them through the eyes of God. You can love them. You can recognize that we're all in the same boat together. It's not you who's worse or me who's worse or you who's better or me who's better. We're all in this together needing God. Romans 5, 18 says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners, but because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. Today, we're all in the same hospital, checked in with the same problem. It's called sin. Every bit of hate in the world is rooted in a misunderstanding about God and who he is and what he wants for us. It's rooted in sin. Now, right now, I'm starting to feel like I'm at UNO. You guys are starting to feel like Professor Josh has gone on too long. But I need you to know, until you admit you're a sinner, you won't see your need for a Savior. Trying to get it right on your own is never going to work. You need to get to God so that you can get right in the world. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus uh, our Lord. The, wage, the paycheck for choosing the wrong thing is, is spiritual death, emotional death, and eventual physical death. The result of sin is always destroying our life. But the free gift of God is life, everybody. It's what God wants to do for us. The study of the origin of man, anthropology, is important because you can see what God's intentions were in the very beginning. The study of sin, you begin to understand what's happening in the middle of our society. You begin to see what's happening in the world and the problems but the beauty of the gospel is we get to see the end of the story. Here that we jump into the study of salvation. Would you give that to me? Welcome to allergy season, everybody. Do you mind if I drink some water? Some of you join me, thank you. <laughs> Sponsored by Dasani. <laughs> Soterology, the study of salvation. In Christianity, salvation is the saving of human beings from sin and its consequences, which include death and separation from God. By Christ's death and resurrection, we are saved three truths that are really important number one god wants to save the world this is so important because god doesn't just want to save you hey everyone god wants to save the world he's not cherry picking a few he said the world and he didn't just say i kind of like them he said i so love them he didn't say, I'm thinking about them sometimes. He said, no, I'm sending my son to save the world. John 3.16, you've seen it at every football game in the world, says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God wants to save the world. God wants to save you. You were in the world. He didn't forget about you, so he's wanting us to make sure that we don't forget about them. You want to get close to God? care about what God cares about the most. You want to care, care for a parent? Love their children. You want to get close to God? 
love his children. You want to be, you want to be in the heart of God? Think about his bride. You're hearing this today. Think about what he created. God wants to save the world. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some account slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for how many? Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God wants to save the world. Pastor, why, would he just hurry up and get on with it? Anybody felt that way? Would he just like, can we just wrap this up? Because heaven feels like a good gig. Amen, everybody. Most of you parents will relate to this in the room. Any parent here knows this feeling. You know the feeling. When your child royally messes up, what do you want to do instinctively? You want to fix it for them, don't you? Every parent, you just, you just I, I just wish that wouldn't happen. Y'all realize that you cannot fix all of your children's mistakes, and if you do try to fix them, you're not you're gonna you're gonna raise children who never leave your house. <laughs> Thirty-two, they're still gonna be dependent on you to fix their problems. When I was um, fifteen, turning sixteen, they changed the the driver's license age in the state of Louisiana. You could get it at fifteen for a long time, and I was driving on the horse farm all the time and wanted to get my license, but. My dad, I think he realized that they were going to change the law, so he kept, oh, we can't go this weekend, we can go this weekend. We literally went on the weekend that they changed the law. Like, we showed up on Monday morning, on Sunday they said, yep, that was the closing date, you have to be 16 now. I think he planned it. <laughs> In between that 15 and 16 year time, when I was I had to go to driving school and get, trying to get my driver's license. Uh, it was that summer. My older brother was working in construction, and so he got me a summer job helping to frame and build houses. And I was just a guy to pick up stuff and carry stuff. I was 15, just building stuff. It, it was great. It was out in the sun. It was, it was fun. And then we're out there on the North Shore across the causeway building this house in the middle of nowhere. And next thing you know, I hear my older brother screaming in the woods to the top of his lungs. He comes walking out with a very large nail through his thumb. Can y'all handle this? Some of y'all look away. <laughs> One of the guys walked up to him, pulling his hammer out of his bag like he was going to back the nail out of his thumb. I'm like, no, we're not doing that. So we took him to the hospital, and they gave him some pain medication, and they removed the nail. I said, you doctors, you've got a stomach for stuff. Can I just tell you, like, the, the ability to they remove the nail, and they wrapped it all up, and... Then they gave him lots of narcotics, okay? That's what they did. And he was, he was so happy going back to the job site. Like, you see my thumb? There was a nail in my thumb. He was so out of it. We got back to the job site, and we're going to put him in the car. And we're like, well, who's going to drive him home? We had to drive across the causeway. The job was going on. I said, I got this. I told you all I didn't have a driver's license. So we rolling across the causeways kind of drizzling driving his buick next thing you know the lights are on in the back cop pulls me over makes me stand in the rain while he scolds me and writes me two tickets one for driving without a license and one for speeding he looks at me and says I'll give you these tickets you're gonna have to you know see the judge da, 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 da. i'm like i mean i don't even have i don't even know what i'm supposed to be doing right now he says, I'm not recommending you get back in, in that car and drive it. I said, well, officer, what am I going to do? So I got back in the car and I drove home. <laughs> Just slower. <laughs> in between that time, my dad helped me to get my driver's license, but instead of stepping in and reaching out to the DEA and trying to figure it and try to plead it down and try to pay it, he said, no, no, you've got a court date. You've got to see the judge. You know what my dad was doing? My dad drove me to court so I could feel the heat, but not go to hell, everybody. He was letting me feel the repercussions of my decision, but still being there to save me. You know what God is doing? God began a good thing. He's got a program for you. He's allowing you to make some decisions to feel what it's like to choose to be separate from God. And then in the end, he's hoping that you'll recognize that he wants to save you all along. I don't know if that helps some of you to understand. He's like a gracious father said, you don't want to be in my house? This is what it looks like to live outside of the house. 
This is what it looks like with you trying to do it your own way. God wants to save everyone, but so we find in the middle of the story that's what he's doing. So number two, we discover that salvation is by faith and grace alone. You can't earn your salvation. You have to receive it. You can't do enough good things. You just got to accept the goodness of God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, to the next four words, you will be saved. God wants to save the world, the whole world. Salvation is by faith and grace alone. Number three, salvation changes everything. Before salvation, I had no choice but to sin. Now that I have received salvation, I have the power to change. You have the power to change. When the Apostle Paul speaks of salvation, he says, we were saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. When he talks about the saving power of God, it has the power to deal with your past, to deal with your present, and to deal with your future. He's helping you to understand that salvation isn't something way back when, that salvation is both in your past, in your present, and in your future. God has saved me, God is saving me, and God will save me, everybody. That's because God is that big. Y'all hearing this today? He's big enough to know what's going to happen. He already knows the book on your life and has chosen to save you. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Adam and Eve began the origin that we see described in the Bible. God began it all. Adam and Eve kind of messed it up. I don't know about you, sometimes I want to get mad at Adam and Eve, but then I realize that if you were there, you probably would have done it too. We see the story going sideways. But in the middle we see Jesus, salvation, grace, available. And we see God saying, salvation is just a down payment of the future I have for you. In 2020, when... The world was kind of going crazy. Anybody remember that year? Some of you have blocked it out. You don't even count it. That year there was lots of health scares, lots of issues. And in that time, uh, my wife Amber was having another physical issue that we really didn't know what was the cause. But she was having some very intense pain we've since discovered. And we've seen God work through not only his hand, but doctor's hands to bring healing to her body but in 2020 she was having such excruciating pain that she would almost like pass out from the pain one night um, kind of oddly the day before we saw someone in a video pass out and fall to the ground and I said to her I said you know if you ever feel dizzy just kneel down as quickly as possible because very few people die from kneeling and falling down it was just random, like random. Some of you are all laughing over here. She, um, one night, called out. And I leaned in to look into our restroom, and I saw her, like, kneeling on the ground, and she passed out entirely from the pain. It's probably one of the scariest moments for me. Like, a lot of emotion here. I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can. I... But to go in and to pick up someone you love, lifeless, all the way to the bed, screaming for someone to call 911, to save a life. And then in a moment, for her to breathe again. We all deal with moments that feel overwhelming. It's the result of sin and pain and loss but salvation is like that breath coming into our lungs salvation was that moment I, when she started breathing, I thought we're going to be okay today I want you to know that, that all of us have had experiences that feel like life has left the room, sin has shown up humanity, what's going on I can't figure it out but today I believe in a God who saves 
in a God who restores life. Amen, everybody. I believe in a God who still heals. I believe in a God who gives us doctors wisdom, but I believe in a God who shows up in every circumstance and is willing to turn it for good. In Romans chapter 5, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You Today, if you put your faith in Jesus, God looks at you through the rose-colored glasses of Jesus. God sees you through the blood of Jesus, just if I had never sinned, just if I had never done wrong, just if I had never gone the wrong way. Today, the study of humanity, sin, and salvation, don't forget that God began the story. God knew what was going to happen in the middle of the story, and like a good father, he's saving you on the end. You're hearing this today. Like a good father, he's not forgotten about us in the process. Today, as we close, of action steps. Would you grab your card? I'm going to give you three action steps that are going to sound a little bit more like believing. But I think we need them. Action step number one regarding humanity. I need you to see the value of humanity through God's eyes. Please stop demeaning. Stop passing on. Stop pushing. Stop pretending that, that human beings, men and women, are made in the image. Stop acting like it's not true. Let's be a people who stands against the hate in the world. See the value of humanity through God's eyes. That's what I need you to do. That's an action step. Number two, I need you to accept the reality of humanity's sinfulness and need for God. And when you accept that, you will recognize that we have a responsibility to bring God to the world. And lastly, Maybe you're here today and you need to receive the free gift of salvation or you need to learn how to offer it. Would you write down your action step? Once you've written it down, just set your things down in your lap or to the side. Would you bow with me? With every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment. I hope today you're leaving with deep thoughts and deep action regarding your faith. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you find yourself far from God, like I found myself, this is your moment to get close to Him. I won't embarrass you. I won't ask you to stand or come to the front. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you need Jesus, would you whisper this prayer? Say, Lord Jesus, I'm giving you my life. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Would you forgive me for trying to live this life my own way? God, would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life? 